This is the Basketball Show with Shane the Hammer Heel. What they gonna say next? Happy Monday, team. Joe and Hammer back with you. It's all thanks to TCL Mobile, NBA 2K23 and UPC Oz. Lots to talk about today. Xavier Cook's headlining the news stories. We'll get to that shortly. It is also a game of peace in the grand final series. We will go in depth in this, but very quickly, one word to describe the series so far. Exciting. It's pretty boring, isn't it? Exciting. But it was exciting. <laughs> it was. I, 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 you know, how the Sydney Kings came back. That was an incredible... In game two. In, in game two. Yeah. I mean, you know, I picked both winners, but um, so it was sort of expected. But with the two guys out, that was in, it really was an incredible win. And uh, Justin Simon, gee whiz. Yeah, you get, the feeling, you get the feeling the breakers will be kicking themselves after game oh. two as well. Plenty coming up. We're also chatting to South East Melbourne CEO Tommy Greer to find out their thoughts uh, and where they're at moving forward. D-Ruck is in as well. Pack show. We love it. Hot. It's hot. Let's in get here. into it. <laughs> This is our TCL starting five. Let's get straight to the finals. Game one, the Breakers had the upper hand. The script was completely flipped for game two, though. What have been your observations so far? Great first game. You could just tell from the very start New Zealand were going out. They came there with a game plan to be able to clog it up. Cooks had virtually no impact whatsoever. And uh, New Zealand played with a whole lot of confidence. McDowell White was exceptional. Just mm -hmm. against that deep drops... Uh, that we spoke about on the show last week, that it, Kings didn't do a good job of being able to play the pick-and-roll defence. And, roll defense. and uh, they got the win. Big win from New Zealand, as we predicted, Joe. But what a turnaround in Game 2. And th that win from the Sydney Kings, exceptional. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. Against all odds. And Justin Simon, even though his stats weren't off the chart, he had 12, 9 and 6 steals. But some of his steals when both teams were struggling to score, they were four-point turnarounds. Oh, crucial, crucial timing. He's the MVP of the finals, leading, leading that sort of category at the moment. Um, for but, it was the, anyway. but it was the times that he did it. He, he would get a steal in the backcourt or when there was no one between him and the basket, steal, basket, steal, basket. Mm. And it just got the King's momentum and that sort of belief because New Zealand were coming and they couldn't make any shots. Had they made a couple of shots... Um, things could have been a little bit different. But I thought Kawat Noy, great job. One of his best games in the Sydney Kings uniform. Geordie Hunter started a bit slow, but I thought he was really good as the game went on. Mm. Glover was good. DJ was good. Huge win. But Cooks and Walton Jr., they must be pretty sore. If you only play four minutes and then you say, I can't play anymore, mm. you must be pretty sore because oh, oh, the only way that's happened to me is if I can't walk. Yeah, OK. What are you suggesting? That he must be pretty sore because he'd have to be, right? Yeah. Okay. You wouldn't play four minutes in the grand final unless you are really, really bad. We'll get on to game three and four with d uh, a little later. Nostradamus. <laughs> I'm back. Uh, but the big news today, Xavier Cooks, officially an NBA player, signing a, a, a multi-year deal with the Washington Wizards, which is essentially the end of this season and next season. Guaranteed. A roster spot. Well done, you. How Zave. fantastic. Well done, and well done to his mum and dad. They've raised a good kid, good family, so very happy, and uh, we were always hoping that this day was going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Unfortunately, we played nine minutes yesterday, and if you, I don't know how closely you are watching, but if you do think about it, you can almost see there's a lot going on in his head uh, when they decided to pull him yesterday. All of a sudden, he becomes a very valuable commodity, therefore the risks of him potentially playing if he is not 100% or a lot greater. So without that NBA contract, you're saying he plays? I think he's tough enough that he, he probably would. What are you yeah. calling him soft now? I'm not calling him soft. I'm <laughs> saying that the, the powers that be <laughs> Valuable are commodity. probably not willing to take as many risks with him. Okay. Um, even though it is the grand final series, but they do have a few days off. Hopefully he's back out there for game three and he can put on a show for all the, the Wizards fans who are now sort of highly interested in, and, and Googling who this guy is and what he's going to add to their organisation. And he'll hit the ground running. I think he's perfectly fit for the NBA style. We've said that 
you know, for the last couple of years. And, uh, yeah, he's going to have a really good career. So well done to him. And Daniel Moldovan for being able to get that deal done. He didn't want to go to summer league and training camps. Why would you go the hard way when you just go <laughs> bang? It'll take a couple of years if you don't mind. That's why they pay Daniel the big bucks. <laughs> uh, the flow-on effect. And by that, I mean free, agents, free agency. And oh, yeah. what players this particularly impacts? You get the feeling that Keanu Pinder's price... Exactly. You said he's up. not even going to be here, Pinder. I still, I still don't think he'll be in Australia. Although maybe this does change that. This is the thing. He's going to get paid. Um, <laughs> do you think that he is the he's the player, or are there other players that also this will impact? I mean, with the way uh, McDowell White's played, his stocks have just lifted to the same sort of level. Mm -hmm. Normally you pay more for a big guy that has an impact than you do a guard, but I think uh, McDowell White's been exceptional. Did learn a lot in that second game, though. He got it handed to him in that second game. The, King, the King, Kings really locked down their defence in that second game. And they had to. That's what you've got to do when mm. you're under man. And McDowell White was just like he was years ago, just you know a little bit lazy on his passes and with that extra pressure, and it created extra turnovers. But there's no doubt he's got a huge ceiling. And uh, But I, I think, back to your original question, uh, Cook's going skyrockets for the big fella in Cairns. Mm -hmm. And now somebody like Sydney in Perth, these teams are going to have to pay a lot of money and maybe able to rival the sort of money you can get playing overseas. And let me tell you, if you're talking about going to Asia or playing in Australia, you're going to play here for a shitload less. It was Perth that you said Keanu... Perth? Who North. did I say? Yeah, Perth and Sydney, I reckon. Yeah, but where will he fit better? Uh, I think he'd fit really well in Perth. Yeah. And with his dad's history in, in Perth, I think that would be a good fit for him. Um, the Cairns Taipans have re-signed their boss, Adam Ford, for another two years. I really like this move. Feels like he's found his feet up in the, the far north. The organisation has been running smoothly. So is he out of contract this year? Oh, I don't or know. Or is it an extra two years? Because I would think, why no, wouldn't I... they sign him for three or four years? Yeah, true. Well, because two years you don't, seems you like don't a... sign anyone for that long these days, really. Why? You just don't need too big a risk. He's, he's, why? He's proven himself. I'm a massive 40 fan. I'm not talking about yeah. him necessarily. I just mean contracts are rarely that long these days. Three-year contract. I would have gone three. But uh, he deserves it. So he well done to 40. He's done a great job this yeah. year. So get a healthy team next year and being able to find a few little diamonds in the rough as well, which you have to when you don't have the same budget as the Sydney Kings and the Perth Wild. Exactly right. Uh, we are talking WNBL now. The season awards last night. Yep. Congratulations to Kayla George, MVP. Yep, no, well done. No surprises there, probably. She had a fantastic season. She I was think. one of a few that you know, could have won it, but yeah, she had an exceptional season. Just unbelievably consistent, game in, game out. Mm -hmm. The only thing that surprised me a little bit is Tiffany Mitchell had an amazing season as well. And sometimes mm. when you've got two really good players, they're taking votes yeah. away from each other. But because they won so many games, they probably got more votes as well. But, uh, yeah, well done to her. Uh, Shannon Seabom, Coach of the Year. Congratulations. Is your yes. man? Yes. My man. What was his word that he used? Oh, <laughs> She had to Google it. Begoggled? No, that's, that's, <laughs> anyway. that's definitely not what God love him. He's, uh, he's a champion. And uh, I got him out of the Institute as a DP and um, known him for a long time. Mm -hmm. And he is a champion. He's done really well. Hopefully he wins a championship now to add to his three times Coach of the year, still only young, he's still only a baby. He can't even grow any facial hair, see? Him? <laughs> and he's not even here to defend himself, the poor <laughs> guy. <laughs> but uh, no, and it's only just starting for him. Really, really big things to come for Shannon Seabomb. Good on you, mate. No doubt. Uh, Defensive Player of the Year, Steph Talbot. Yes. Um, I was worried she wasn't going to get that. Uh -huh. Sometimes I, I thought she might have been a bit undervalued this year because her team didn't do well, but huge impact from her. Um, Isabel Lace as well was oh. um, six women of the year and also the breakout player um, and, and she future did. Future WNBA player, future Opal. She is, is moving in stride. When you, see her, when you see her in real life, her shoulders are like swimmers. Uh -huh. Doesn't translate when you see her on TV. She's a really solid, strong girl, really um, talented, still only a teenager, so huge future for her. Well done. Uh, first team, Christy Wallace, Sammy Whitcomb, Kayla George, Tiana Hawkins, Kayla Thornton. Second team. Jade Melbourne, Tiff Mitchell, Lauren Nicholson, Steph Talbot and Lauren Scherf. Anybody who should be feeling hard done yes, by? Yes, Steph Reid. She led the league in assists. She's playing on the okay. top team. Mm. They went on an 11-game winning streak. They're the title favourites and she doesn't make the top two. She won the Golden Hands Award, which is a great award, by the way. The NBL needs to have the Golden Hand Award. 
So um, great award. And uh, yeah, so she, she's probably the only one that I would think that was hardly done by, but um, everyone well deserved. Yeah, okay. No, congratulations to, to everyone. Um, indeed, it looked like a, a really wonderful night. Um, there she is. Uh, looking amazing. Uh, the finals, as you mentioned, are yep. upon us. Townsville finished top. They take on the Perth Lynx in their semi-final series. Is that a wash? I think they get it done. Yep. They've proven to be able to beat them quite convincingly, even of recent times without key players. So I think they win it. I think they realise they're going to be on the Melbourne battle. Mm. And I would have thought maybe Melbourne's going to get over the line, but by the fact that Southside beat them three times. They will come in with so much confidence. Who? The Flyers. They've beaten, yeah, they've beaten them three times, mm. which surprises me because when I look at the matchups, I think Melbourne's a better team. I think they've got better talent. So I'm in two minds about which way that's going to go. I would have said Melbourne, but based on the history, flip of the coin. Okay. Well, I might have to ask you at the end of points made for your, uh, for your <laughs> odds so that we can give it to the yes. UPC Oz there you go. Uh, fans. Yes, we'll do that. Hopefully they followed me take, last take week. Take it with a pinch of salt, though. <laughs> Hopefully they followed me last week. Time now to welcome in former NBL MVP Derek Rucker as we do every week for Points Made thanks to UPC Oz. D, how are you doing this week? Very well, Joe. Hammer, what do you got for me? Well, I do have something for you, D, and uh, no surprise, but director Dave, he's got some unbelievable edits that he just keeps nice and close. So let's get to the videotape. I think it's going to be a tough game. I'm actually going to predict that New Zealand win game one and then the Kings fight back and win game two because the Kings play better, I think, on the road than they do at home. So what do you think about that? that, that in no way is that happening. That's, I mean, that's ambitious of you, but it, that's not happening at all. <laughs> a bit fidgety there when I made that, uh, made that call. I'm hot, mate. It's 38 degrees here. I'm hot on the tips. UPC Oz punters are messaging me everywhere. I'm that hot. I could go for a swim in that brown water behind you. Yeah, well, uh, that was a great prediction. But did you actually generate any money for the viewers? You gotta say that you gotta put your house on it, Hammer. Oh, sorry. No, I didn't. I didn't go that far, mate. Like you did in Melbourne. But we'll all take that. It was. Uh, what, what did you make of the the uh, the first two games, mate? Game one was really tough, and uh, I thought it was exciting. It was hard to predict, but I thought New Zealand clearly were the better team. But they did benefit from some, some good fortune with Cooks and obviously Walton Jr. going down. Now, at the end of game one, there was no way I thought that Sydney, given what had transpired, were going to be able to battle back. But Hammer, game two was one of the guttiest performances I've ever seen in a, in a grand final or championship series context. And I don't even know what to make of it other than outstanding, outstanding resolve from the Kings and big time defensive plays by Justin Simon to flip that game right when I thought New Zealand were about to take over. Well, they did, didn't they? And I, I thought Chase Buford did a good job in that second half too, yeah. going to that little zone defense that he's played very little of all year, but it really took them out of what they were doing New Zealand. They didn't have any answers for it. Now they're going to have some time to be able to lick their wounds. Uh, McDowell White, he's been unbelievable all year and great in game one, but geez, he was just a little laconic for me against the pressure, and he's going to have to step up. Well, this is a great thing about a series because everyone makes adjustments. And as you mentioned, Chase Buford did a great job in coming out and finding something that was effective. And also, Hammer, didn't you think New Zealand just looked tight also to start the game before they even really got into it? I just felt, you know, no buckets in the first four and a half minutes on your own court. That's, uh, man, that had to be some type of record also. But, but you know what else I thought they did is, is they didn't play to score. So they were playing off the pick and rolls and McDowell White was coming off looking for his options as a distributor. The Sydney Kings did a great job of not allowing him to find anyone off the pick and roll because they didn't rotate. And that's the adjustment guards need to make as well. They need to play what's in front of them. And when the opportunity is to score, they have to go score. When the opportunity is to read rotations, they're going to find the passer. And that'll be a really good learning curve for McDowell White. You guys have both mentioned the word adjustment. D, game three, Friday night, what do the breakers need to do in order to get back up and take a 2-1 lead home? Well, there's a bit of a mystery over who's going to be on the floor for the Kings, and sometimes that can throw a coach's game planning 
off also. I mean, I would assume that Cooks and Walton Jr. are going to have ample time to recover Joe and be ready to go per usual in game three. So now it's kind of you're rebooting this whole series, and it's a best of three, Howard. How can you, I mean, what you came into game one with if you're New Zealand, I guess you kind of have to revert back to that. But the thing I would worry about is the psychological damage to the breakers going back. Wow, man, they must have really thought they had this series in their hands and a firm grip on that trophy, and now it's wide open again. Well, uh, they look like they were not scared, but just playing content. Looked like they were happy with the game one performance. They didn't put a foot on the throat. They didn't come with that mentality. They did when they walked into Sydney. They have to get back to that. They, you can't be scared yeah. of missing shots. You gotta go make plays. <laughs> if you miss it, you deal with it, you go on. Brown does that really well. He doesn't care whether he misses shots. And it wasn't until they were down in that last quarter when you started to see Liafa start making a few threes. But before that, everyone was just a little bit tight and I think they'll revert back. I actually think they've got a chance to be able to get another win. I think, that, I think this is gonna go the first three games to the away teams, which will be unheard of, wow. but I think it can happen, I really do. So Hammer, Derek mentioned that game three is essentially the start of a, a, a clean slate. For all your UPC Oz fans out there, if this is a three game, se game series from here on in, who are you tipping? Whoever wins game three is going to win this. And I've wow. just tipped, yeah, I, I think that New Zealand can win it still. Um, and again, we've already spoken about the respect we had for the way the Sydney Kings played. Their backs with the walls, a couple of key players out, they really stood up. And it wasn't just Justin Simon. Kuat Noy was awesome. Um, other guys, Glover came in, hit some big shots as well. They all contributed and had a belief to be able to do it. But now New Zealand go away. They're going to be able to make some adjustments, try and get somebody to the free throw line. I'd be getting Brantley to the free throw line and get some real pick and rolls against the zone defence. They can't be lost. There's no elements of a surprise against that anymore. They have to be better prepared and they have to play like there's nothing to lose. They've got to learn from game two. That's a great breakdown, Hammer. I don't have anything to add to that. That's, uh, that's very true. And my confidence uh, before the series started was pretty high with New Zealand. That's all been eliminated. I have no idea at this point. All right, guys, let's switch our focus to the NBA. Ja Morant, what is going on there? He was seen with a firearm in his IG live. The NBA are investigating. It was originally said that he would take two games away from the Grizzlies organisation. That was never happening, Joe. He is now out indefinitely. It's not good for the league. It's not good for him as an individual. It's not good for the Grizzlies. It's not the first incident involving a, a police report and an investigation over the past 12 months for Jarrett. Screams of self-sabotage to me. Derek, what was your first thought when you saw the news? Well, guys, this is probably some of the most disappointing news that uh, has come about in the sports world, particularly in the basketball world, in a number of years. This is a guy who is climbing so quickly in popularity, and with his basketball brilliance, he's sitting on an absolute gold mine hammer. Some might say a platinum mine. But look here, this is problematic because as an African American, the number of problems that we have socially in the United States with gun violence is beyond out of control. And Ja is one of the leading role models in the country and internationally. He affects impressionable young African-American kids so tremendously. So this behavior is just so disappointing that he is not more responsible. Now you don't have to accept the role model image, but you have to project something that is good modeling for your community. And on a wider scale, Shane, this is a country riddled with gun violence, school shootings. Everything is so bad in the United States right now as it pertains to weapons. Man, we could go on for 30 minutes talking about this situation, but the disappointment in my voice is probably palpable. This is a guy who I really enjoy, and not to mention the Nike, uh, the Nike issue. They've just issued a shoe. On, on behalf of him, a signature shoe, the Ja Morant. What do they do? Hammer, I'm sure you got plenty to say, but that's kind of where I'm coming from at the moment. Well, Hammer, before you go, Nike released a statement. They said, we appreciate Ja's accountability that he is taking the time that he needs to get help. We support his prioritization of his well-being. So they've certainly left the door open for him. But Hammer, what are, what are your thoughts? I agree with everything that Derek said. I don't think it's self-sabotage, Ja. I think it's somebody that has just got ahead of himself thinks that he can't be touched. He can do whatever he wants to do. 
wants to be a gangster but wants to take tens of millions of dollars for playing basketball and you don't have to be a role model but you've got to take some sort of social responsibility to understand what's going on in your country and how you can make a difference you don't need to try and be some thug you need to try and make a difference for people. So uh, he's been well and truly flicked on the nose um, by the NBA and by his sponsors, told to pull his head in, he'll go away. No different than what they did to Kyrie, where he had to make you know, an apology and the same thing because he was going through the same thing with some of the things that he was starting to go down different channels with and he was able to correct that. Jar will do the same thing. Hopefully he learns from it and hopefully he continues to be better within the society of the NBA. Yeah, exactly right. Hopefully and, an opportunity. Sorry, go on, Dave. And Hammer, this is very similar to like when we talked about load management. You know, the focus gets shifted off the main thing. The main thing is just go out and play basketball. It's not that difficult. Focus on the game. Leave all the other extracurricular stuff, all the load management, all that extra stuff. Just play the game. Be a good person and enjoy it and move on. Like, why is he trying to be a gangster? I mean, when they've researched him, he, he he's comes from a good family. He's not from the hood. And if you're trying to be something you're not and you lose your identity, this is always what's gonna happen. Yeah, as I was gonna say, an opportunity to come out the other side, he certainly needs to under understand what's at risk. Um, a wake up call, I guess you could say. Flick on the nose, Joe. That's uh, what it is. Let's uh, focus on KD. He's played three games for the Phoenix Suns so far. Three wins. He's had 23 20 and 37 today against the Dallas Mavericks. 12 of 17 from the field. That was amazing. KD, D Book, Kyrie, and Luka Doncic as well out there on the court. D, what did you make of it? And what have you made uh, of KD since he's been a Phoenix Sun? Well, we knew that he was slot in nicely because, you know, as one of the themes goes with KD, the less things he has to worry about, the better he is. And Phoenix is a good platform for him just to concentrate on going out there and giving people points. And that's what he's doing. You see already in three games, and it's not easy. It's not easy slotting into a new team and being able to average 27, 28 a game. There are many reasons for that. One is sometimes you, don't, you feel like you don't want to step on people's feet. But I think the Suns would have no problem with him, Shane, coming in and trying to get as many buckets as he can. And to go for 37 today, Shane, he's the best player in basketball. Let's not get crazy. He is the purest um, edition of basketball. He's a great selfless superstar. And I think when he's on top of his game, he's the most enjoyable player to watch. Well, I think it's a good fit. We said that when he first went there, that uh, Devin yeah. Booker is another superstar. So his first couple of games, he diverts a little bit to, to Booker. You do your thing, mate. I'm happy just to be able to ride yeah. with you. Game three, he goes, bang, there's 37. He'll have some games where he has 40 and 50 points before the end of the season as he gets more comfortable. And I think it'll be easy for him with someone like Chris Paul that doesn't care how many shots he takes. He's happy to distribute, run the plays for the right people. They'll take the, bel uh, the bulk of the shots. Other role players will fit in from time to time. But those two are the best combination in basketball right now now even better than your boys over at the Mavs nice little dime there from uh, Jock Landale if you're looking at the vision as well D from what you've seen so far will they be in the conference finals Joe I think they will be in the conference finals but I'm interested to hear against who you think they may face Shane now Chris Paul you mentioned he's got the perfect role now for who he is as a point guard this guy loves to lead he loves to distribute and all he wants to do is make key buckets so I love the way the Suns are laid out. Golden State finally got Steph Curry back today. They looked okay. It's going to take them a week or two to get going. But again, Hammer, I'm going Phoenix, Golden State, Western Conference Finals. What about Denver? No. Oh, I am so on the Denver train. Come my, on, my money's on the Nuggets. They looked so good at the moment. I think Denver's going to play against Phoenix Suns, no doubt about that. I think it'll be a great conference final. And obviously everyone's going to talk it up that here come Golden State. But I think they're going to fall yeah. short this year, D. Possibly. Plenty more to play out in terms of the NBA season anyway as we roll towards the pointy end. D, love your work as always. We'll see you here in the studio next week. Oh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. That's if he doesn't get caught up in the Sydney lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
to go in depth thanks to NBA 2K23. We've got South East Melbourne CEO Tommy Greer with us. Tommy, thanks so much for joining the basketball show. I want to ask you about the season that's just been obviously tough to miss out on finals, really tough from an injury point of view. You've since parted ways with Simon Mitchell. How do you reflect now that it's been a couple of weeks since then? Oh, well, firstly, thanks for, for having me. You know, I'm a frequent viewer of the show, but I think it's the first time I've been on. So thanks for having me uh, on the show, guys. Um, I guess in reflection of the season, you know, in many ways, there was, you know, quite a lot of successes throughout the year. But then uh, to finish the way we did, I think sort of leaves a little bit of a cloud over the whole thing. Um, we thought we had an incredibly talented roster going into the season. And, and like you mentioned, I think we got hit with um, some injuries that are really poor time um, coming out of out of Christmas and sort of as we started to make that charge towards finals and potentially position ourselves so um, that made life really difficult um, but um, you know to make the postseason I think was a great success and of course to win the Battle of Melbourne for the first time in our four years uh, was a good step in the right direction as well. First of all mate well done um, on the job you've done so far and, and the parting of ways with Simon Mitchell as well. Four years there was so many positives, a few question marks and everything else but both of you guys handled it with a whole lot of class. Not all organisations uh, do that uh, but how do you reflect on the first four years that you've been there now through the ups and downs? Yeah, well, it's similar to as you mentioned right there, incredibly proud of the first four years to be honest. Um, to be a startup franchise and then hit with a, a global pandemic for, for the next two years of that and then come out and make the postseason two out of our first four years uh, in existence as a club to have a winning record, uh, three seasons out of, out of our first four. Um, you know, in, incredibly uh, proud of how the, the franchise has come about and the brand that we've developed within uh, the NBL and, and, and within players and administrat administrators around the league. So. Um, we look back really fondly, um, and like you said, it was uh, we're really um, happy with the way that we're able to exit Simon. He's been a uh, uh, an incredible um, servant of the club over those four years, and I think it uh, for those who haven't experienced being part of a startup franchise in, in any way, um, probably will never really understand the amount of heavy lifting. Um, required by by the first head coach to be able to set up a entire performance program and and lead it the way he has over the four, first four years. No credit to Simon and you guys as an organisation as well. Looking forward, what is the the timeline on a new coach? How is the search coming along? There were reports last season that you're going after Brian Gorgian. Is that something that could potentially come to fruition coming up? I feel like that comes out at least once a season, sometimes twice a season <laughs> that, one, that one comes up. So it's uh, one we've gotten quite used to, to handling. Um, but in terms of the, the head coach search, um, you know, as you said, Hammer, we wanted to really make sure that we exited Simon the right way, given everything he's, he's done for the club. Um, we've now started that process of uh, searching for um, our next head coach. Uh, we've been overwhelmed with the amount of interest. And I think it's a, it's a real sort of credit to where the club's at, the amount of high level interest that we've had uh, in the role. Um, our plan is to keep those sort of expressions of interest open um, through the majority of March. Um, and then we'll sort of shortlist and by early April, um, around when sort of free agency will be commencing is when we'll be looking to um, secure that head coach and, and announce it publicly. How much um, input does your head coach have? Is that something that you do a lot of, and then the head coach fits in. You've done a great job, particularly last year, of putting three incredible imports together that fit really well and were really well balanced as well. Yeah, look, I, I would assume, and from conversations around the league, it's different sort of with, with different coaches and different uh, setups um, within performance teams and structures within, within um, each franchise. But Simon and I really did work hand in hand. Um, he, he did uh, some incredible work on the recruiting front, but um, everything we did really was uh, together in terms of that recruiting process. So uh, going into this year, I'm definitely gonna take a, a, a more hands-on approach, at least for the first uh, month or so um, of the off season. Um, but you know, we remain incredibly confident when you have a look at the rosters we've put um, together over the last sort of couple of years. Um, very confident that we're going to be able to um, bring together something that's uh, going to be there and competing next year. 
What are your thoughts around the imports at the moment? You guys are pretty quick to re-sign Al Williams, big source, but what about the likes of, of Trey and, and Gary as well? What's the mindset? What's your thinking at the moment? Yeah, look, I mean, we're, we're very happy. We're very happy with both Gary and Trey. Um, as you said, Hammer, um, they were really good for us last year. They fit really well together. There was a really good chemistry there with all three of them and also with the Australians. And that's something that we don't want to overlook. Um, both had the ability to play two ways, um, which was an incredible benefit for us. Um, and both players we remain really interested in. Um, I think first and foremost, um, focus for us is on securing that head coach. Um, following that, uh, the Australian contingent will be um, where our focus shifts. Uh, and then from there, we'll fill in um, the gaps we need with, with the uh, internationals and, and import roster spots. Well, big uh, free agency coming up, and probably the two biggest names are going to be Keanu Pinder and uh, Will McDowell-White, who's been incredible this season. Pinder, probably not so much for you guys, but McDowell-White, he is going to be sought after by everybody. Yeah, I would think that um, you know when the time comes, pretty much every NBL club will be you know putting their hand up or throwing their hat in the ring um, uh, when free agency opens uh, for a player of, of that caliber and a, a local of that caliber, which is the way you know every time free agency comes around. So um, he's had an incredible season, um, and uh, yeah, as you mentioned, no doubt I think he'll he'll have a whole lot of interest from a whole lot of NBL clubs. He certainly will. He's obviously still in action with the Breakers. What have you made of the Grand Final series so far? Yeah, really contrasting couple of performances. Uh, the first win by New Zealand um, up at Kudos Bank really surprised me. You know, I had the Kings sort of penciled in for that that first one. Um, and, you know, credit to the man we are just talking about there, Will McDowell-White and the performance he put in um, was truly outstanding. And, and then once again, credit to the Kings to be able to bounce back undermanned. Um, I thought that was uh, an enormous performance by them, um, returning serve. So really interesting to see how this is going to play out. Uh, now a three-game series and, um, you know, the, the Kings have, have managed uh, Cooks really well. So, you know, hoping he can get back out there on the floor and, and we can see sort of both teams at near full strength going at it for the last three. Mate, just want to talk to you a little bit about the basketball capital of Australia. Growing up at the Nunawad Inspectors, I lived it, I know it. But talk to us about all those great things that are happening in that region with the amount of people that are playing and the support that you guys have got there. It is absolutely the, uh, the basketball capital of Australia. No, no ways around that. Um, lots of things happening. I mean, it's, uh, quite obviously the, the, the refurbishment and redevelopment of the, of the State Basketball Centre uh, is well underway. It's on track. It's due to be delivered um, in August of this year, and that will see us um, have the best uh, uh, sports, uh, professional sports facilities uh, in the country, especially um, relating to the NBL. So we're really looking forward to moving in to the new redeveloped centre. It's a $130 million project, and, uh, and we can't wait for that to be finished and, and get in there and, and start making, making the most of it. Hey, Tony, quick one before we let you go. You obviously had a, a pretty successful career yourself. Do you, do you miss it as a, a CEO in your position? And I guess how do you, do you watch it now and, and, and see how the games change and almost wish that you were back out there now? Or did you prefer sort of back in the day when you were playing? I think an incredibly successful career is probably a slight overstatement, but uh, <laughs> I did play for a little portion of time. Um, to be quite honest, I get this get asked this question a lot, and, and not really. You know, when I finished, I finished, uh, and, and that was the end. It was time to move on to to new things, and so my focus sort of s switched pretty quickly um, from the time I finished playing basketball, and and that's sort of what's led me down this path and and to where we are currently. Well, good job, Tommy. You've done. Uh, it's tough, as you said, first four years of a brand new franchise, but you've done a great job. We wish you luck next year, and uh, can't wait to see what free agency brings you and a new head coach. Come mm -hmm. on, Gorge. We want Gorge. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks, so much Thanks, for Tommy. Me. It has been a full show. That is all we've got time for. Hammer. It's been fun. Certainly has. Big week. Semi-finals in the WNBL game. Three and four in the NBL. Oh, ho, ho. lots to talk about next uh, week, Jojo. It's going to be great. Also, forgot to give a shout out to Director Dave's New York Knicks. They've won nine in a row, and I can't believe they haven't actually finished Does their game. Does he still barrack for them? Yeah, I haven't apparently. heard for ages. Have you blocked okay. him?
No, that's good though. Um, well they are locked in uh, double overtime with the Celtics at the moment. They're up 126, 121. That will be their 10th win in a row if they can pull it off. Who are they playing? The Celtics. Go Celts. <laughs> uh, thank you guys for watching. Thank you to TCO Mobile, NBA 2K23 and UPC Oz. We'll be back next week. This is a co-production by News Corp Australia and Closer Sports.